the way we actually employ it with some examples. Um, Foipro has built uh, a highly scalable and redundant cloud communication platform providing audio and video uh, and complex, uh, complete fixed model integration uh, for telco use, wholesale and uh, hosted PBX uh, customers. Uh, our feature servers are built around a particularly monolithic beast that most of us use, uh, but we dare not name. Um, most people know that uh, connecting that beast to the public internet is usually the beginning of the end for any serious VoIP-oriented company that uh, wants to do any serious skip. Uh, so we use OpenSips a lot. Um, for things as uh, routing, redundancy, handling NAT, uh, registration, presence, etc. Uh, this talk is about another way we use OpenSips, uh, namely as a toolkit to solve many small specific issues. And the name of the talk, OpenSips as a toolkit. So, why exactly is OpenSips uh, a good match for us? Um, well, root selection is an important part of, of OpenSips for each serious uh, VoIP player. Being able to adjust to your routing uh, easily is key. Uh, <coughs> OpenSips uh, open offers a powerful routing engine in the form of deroutting. We've heard about that before. Uh, the routing engine uh, provides you with uh, reusable routes um, that support any granularity you might require. However, besides being a very, very capable SIP router, OpenSIPs can be so much more. Uh, it can also be deployed as a toolbox for fixing certain erroneous behavior of specific devices or systems. Uh, the Swiss Army knife for SIP, so to speak. Controlling which headers are passed uh, along or allowed in is, is very useful. We uh, at Voipro define certain SIP headers where, which we use internally for accounting or influencing uh, routing decisions. Uh, we make sure these handers never leak to our customers or carriers, and we ignore uh, these handers when they're coming in from a customer or carrier. One of the reasons OpenSIPS is so powerful as a toolkit uh, is the scripting language at its core, which, while being very feature-rich, is also very performant. The scripting layer provides us with a lot of functionality to manipulate the contents of or making additional routing decisions based on the contents of the SIP messages. Uh, the configuration allows us to perform uh, decisions or manipulations in all paths of the SIP conversation. When a new request comes in or on the reply path, uh, we group common functionality in the SIP routes, which are reused from other routes, and there's a plethora of functions available. To prevent OpenSIPs from becoming a resource-hungry monster uh, that packs all features all the time and requiring massive configuration bootstrapping, OpenSIPs was written to be highly modular. You only include the modules you need for the specific purpose of your OpenSIPs in, uh, instance. This mod modularity means that OpenSIPs can be as lightweight as you want it to be. And the more you specialize your OpenSIPS instances, the lighter it becomes. We've used these properties uh, to create a small amount of minimal profiles for our OpenSIPS instances. Each new instance we require is based on such a profile and we, that we adapt it to the specific situation we need it for. Each instance only carries the open, uh, OpenSIPS features it needs. Allowing OpenSIPS to be as lean as you want it to be has several, several very useful uh, advantages. It allocates, uh, allocates only the memory it needs for the specific task you deploy it for, and it will not waste CPU cycles doing anything it doesn't have to. <coughs> As OpenSIPS only manages uh, signaling and not the actual audio uh, or video, having a slightly higher latency uh, stops being an issue. Not many people care if a call takes 30 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds to reach uh, the feature server. Waiting for the remote party to answer the phone usually is the longest wait. Uh, as long as the audio uh, or in, in video is handled in a low latency path, 
all is good. So the combination of these two features, uh, the lightweight nature and the allowance for a slightly higher latency, make OpenSips an excellent candidate for running it in a small virtual <coughs> machine, a Docker instance or whatever the preferred containment method du jour is. Uh, the modularity and lean nature of OpenSips allows you uh, for a very unconventional operation method when comparing it to traditional telco setups. You can, you can run as many instances as you want, uh, side by side, it doesn't matter. You can start using tiny OpenSips instances for just about any task. And having many OpenSips uh, instances at your disposal means you can chain them all together each step in the chain performing a specific task. Connecting to a new type of system or performing a certain task uh, when a certain condition is met can be implemented in a new instance and once it's properly tested, you can adjust the roots uh, of the other instances to root calls through your new instance. Allowing the use of a lot of specialized containers grants you a lot of flexibility. You can perform a lot of little tasks really well in a specialized fashion which matches well, uh, very well with the old Unix philosophy. Do one thing, do it well. Also, like Unix, you start using OpenSips instances like pipes in, in the shell command. Each instance performing a task on some input and forwarding the result to the next chain, uh, <coughs> the next step in the chain. Some use cases can be abstracted better than others. I'll admit that. So you'll probably end well with a, lot, a few larger instances that perform the larger tasks, like routing, accounting, uh, and a bunch of satellites around that that perform very specific tasks. Think about every little bit of think, uh, tinkering you'll ever need. The use cases for these uh, satellites usually fall into one of three categories. Security. You can easily insert an OpenSips instance somewhere in the chain at the edge, that perform some specific security task. SIP processing. OpenSIPs can process nearly any message. It's one of the most RFC compliant SIP servers out there. It can basically talk to anything. Flexibility. Use OpenSIPs instances to fix quirks for certain types of interconnections, rewriting headers, uh, using agents, of, uh, using uh, use of user agents or tags, called uh, based on certain properties. Let's uh, dig a little deeper into the security advantages uh, of having a highly modular OpenSIPS deployment strategy. It sounds very cloudy, doesn't it? Um, in general, you can use tools like Pike to detect denial of service attacks, <coughs> SIP scans, and actively block them, either from within the OpenSIPS instance or by feeding them back into your blacklist. <coughs> Uh, of your firewall. Um, insert a small OpenSIPS at the publicly addressable edge of, uh, of a chain uh, and use Spike without having to bother uh, integrating it into the rest of your configuration. It's just a satellite. Furthermore, functions like uh, validate dialog and uh, SIP message dialog validate can help detect a lot of bogus or rejected messages. Validate dialog uh, checks if your currently received message is valid at all for the state of the current dialog uh, uh, is in. It verifies the sequence, uh, sequence number of the message and um, the contact uh, and the root set. Sit message validates, uh, validate verifies if all the mandatory uh, headers for each type of message and reply are present. And where possible, it verifies them. You can deploy links in your chain where open SIPs only performs validation, rejects invalid messages, and passes the rest along to the next link. Now, there are other ways where OpenSIPs can help you increase security. Take your features number for, uh, server, for example. Whether it's the monolithic one I mentioned earlier, uh, or the one supplied by a certain large PC software manufacturer uh, that has a proven track record of bad security questionable security. Um, in general, you can say um, that as more functionality is added to a feature server, the larger the chance of the presence of a security problem becomes. 
by wrapping an OpenSIPS instance around your feature server, you can drastically reduce the chance of an, uh, a successful attack. Better yet, if there are known uh, vulnerabilities for which you can patch, or maybe there's no patch available yet, you can use that OpenSIPS instance to scan for the attack pattern and block them automatically um, and add them to your blacklist. While security through obscurity may not be the best solution for all security problems, it makes discovery um, of the internal topology a lot harder, uh, hence the name. Hiding your internal topology is generally considered a good idea. You can use it to make sure your carriers don't know who your customers are, vice versa, to hide the inner workings of your platform, and to prevent strange devices at the remote end I'm talking about you, SIP alt enabled routers, uh, tripping over large messages thanks to the extra routing information. The B2B module or back to back user agent sets up um, a, setter, uh, a separate internal and external dialogue, forwarding messages between them without uh, forwarding anything but the whitelist headers. This means you can create a completely separate environment for the internal and external topology where nothing can leak through. Uh, the topology hiding module on the other hand keeps the same dialogue in place but strips and restores routing headers such as uh, fire and uh, record route. Because topology hiding doesn't create a separate dialogue, it's considered a lighter weight solution if all you want to do uh, is hide your internal topology. It's the name. Uh, one downside of to topology hiding is that it requires a little bit of extra work. It's not fully automatic. You have to call a function uh, when processing a message uh, to match uh, secondary uh, replies on, a, on, a, on an initial message. <coughs> Whichever way you choose, using a separate instance does nothing but uh, that does nothing but topology hiding again, greatly simplifies your configurations. Other instances on either <coughs> side of the topology hiding uh, instance still just keep working the same way they did before. Now, as I said before, OpenSIPS provides a very standard compliant SIP processing engine that contains a fairly complete implementation of the SIP RFCs. However, don't confuse standard compliancy with rigidity. OpenSIPS is very forgiving and will handle almost anything you throw in. This means that it will be able to communicate with anything that even remotely symbols, uh, resembles SIPs. Um, there are a lot of SIP servers out there that let you subscribe on invite methods and make, uh, make it follow some form of dial plan. But how many of these servers allow you to process a subscribe message uh, coming in in a way that's just as flexible? OpenSIPS allows you to script any method the way you want it. Whether it's a new request uh, or an in dialogue message, OpenSIPS will run through its script. Uh, if you need flexible and dynamic routing within your, to within your topology, uh, OpenSIPS got you covered. We use NAPTR records uh, internally to route messages to the next chain um, and for simple conversations to do whatever, basically. Uh, changes. Uh, uh, change, uh, changes in the way calls are routed through our internal topology becomes a matter of simply adjusting our DNS records. You can also use OpenSIFs to make things easier down the line by manipulating headers and request headers. Um, Common uses involve changing the default route uh, of a SIP packet based on the original uh, originating IP address, stripping uh, the 5060 port in uh, EU RISE for devices that do NAPTR wrong, uh, forwarding from a TCP based external service to an uh, UDP based platform, um, making sure and making sure a SIP conversation follows rules. Uh, as well as fixing potential MAT issues. Many servers, especially feature servers, focus on class 5 features and hide or even prevent access to anything on the SIP network. <coughs> Open SIPs, however, uh, is all about SIP. You can do almost anything with uh, anything you want with any SIP message. 
OpenSips allows you to add or adjust or remove individual headers and manipulate the request body. If you need to mark the point of origin, just add a header. Uh, want to reduce the message size, for, ex for example, to prevent uh, UDP fragmentation, just drop any headers you don't require. A common problem is uh, handling of formatting uh, of caller IDs and destination numbers. Internally, um, we rewrite, uh, rewrite all caller IDs and destination numbers to uh, E164 formats, or country, area code, subscriber number, um, without any prefixes, infixes, suffixes, or whatever. Some of our carriers, however, may require us to prefix all dialed numbers with an account code, or require special formatting uh, for certain destination prefixes. OpenSips allows us to spin up uh, a little module that sits in front of the regular routing engine that connects to the carrier, um, and the rest of the platform can remain ignorant about these intricacies and just work the way they do. For a more esoteric example, there's a SIP phone manufacturer uh, that overall produces pretty decent devices, but as of some firmware revision, they added a lot of diagnostic headers, headers that are of no use to anyone except the phone itself maybe. Uh, those extra headers uh, happen to push the size of the impact packages uh, beyond the MTU size. And we really prefer our UDP back uh, messages to remain below the MTU threshold to prevent fragmentation. So on the dispatcher that initially processes the packets, um, we tacked on another small OpenSips instance that just removes these headers altogether. Um, the message drops below the MTU threshold, everybody's happy, and the rest of the platform wasn't affected. Uh, OpenSips also allows you to inspect and manipulate request bodies. Commonly, uh, these are SDP bodies. Uh, nowadays, also compressed message uh, bodies. Uh, but they can be anything, really. Uh, also provided are a number of convenience functions to, for example, prioritize the codex if you prefer uh, by changing the codec order, removing codex. Uh, it allows you to further shrink the message size if you want it. Uh, we encountered some edge cases where destinations were internable using the G729 codec, even though the termination partner did offer that codec. Um, if the dialing party, party would support the G729, a G729 only audio path was negotiated and there would be no audio. Uh, we easily solved this by adding a trivial uh, instance between the carrier and us, um, that for these specific prefixes would just drop the G729 codec. It wouldn't be negotiated. Uh, transcoding started and everybody's happy. Now, putting it all together, uh, I've prepared, well, one of the, the use cases we use uh, OpenSIP for, like I said before, is as a small wrapper around uh, all our feature servers. Uh, the added security is obvious, I already mentioned that. We can easily filter exactly what we want to allow the feature service process. Uh, any methods or destinations that somehow end up at the doorstep of the feature server uh, won't be allowed in. They will be just filtered out and rejected. Um, also, in an earlier version of our platform. We used the feature server uh, to handle presence information. However, the server we used wasn't actually very good at managing presence information to the amount of users we were allocating on it. Uh, bringing down the number of users uh, per server wasn't really an option, uh, so we deployed OpenSips, another instance, to track the present state of the users instead. OpenSIP's present state uh, tracking doesn't have the same scalability issues, so instead of having to scale the number of users down, we were able to scale the number of users per server up. Um, and to implement it, uh, we use OpenSIP's capability to act on any method uh, to intercept the messages related to present state uh, management and forward them to anything but the feature server. 
Another example um, is today. Uh, almost every SIP server uses either LR is uh, on or just LR to signify loose routing uh, in the headers, even though the specifications say it should be LR. Now, most SIP, uh, SIP servers employ RFC 1122 uh, robustness, uh, robustness principle. Uh, be liberal in what you accept, be conservative uh, in what you send. So, you would send LR is on to accommodate agents uh, that, that require that, but you'll accept just LR just as well. Now, Microsoft Link doesn't accept, uh, accept LR is on, which is unfortunate. To make matters worse, Microsoft Link, the Microsoft Link mediation server not only rejects messages that have LR is on on the newest routing header, but even in routing <coughs> headers from earlier steps in the routing, uh, even though it has no business looking at it. If it encounters LR is on on any routing header, it will simply reject the message. Now, Microsoft being Microsoft, they will not fix this, and we've actually like, discussed this with their engineers. And that's, they're just not going to change this today. To solve this, we've packed an extra open SIPs between our platform and the Microsoft Link mediation server that does nothing but changing the occurrences of all R is on to just all R. Uh, images flowing to Link and changes occurrences of all R back to all R is on, images flowing from Link to our platform. Adding and removing three characters over and over again. Pretty miserable life for an OpenShift instance, but it's an option. Um, I hope I've been able to show you that because of the low resource usage and flexibility of uh, OpenShift, you can use it to create a chain of single purpose instances that acts as, uh, as a Swiss knife to reduce the complexity of each other instance. Thank you for listening. Any questions? <coughs> Just can you explain a little bit better uh, how you do you make forward? Because if you have an, uh, no, I know uh, in, in the way maybe the way you make the forward, but every forward will you increase the size of the packet uh, from uh, via and record route and so on. So. Just to, to uh, explain us uh, best practice uh, on how to do it, if, if how to loop uh, uh, on the same machine with a local port, uh, removing some headers, and so on, and how to uh, to bring in the middle uh, a new a new uh, kind of uh, application. So I can call it a little application service at this point, mm -hmm. uh, something like this. Yeah. Well, um, currently most of our servers are just configured to forward to a specific host by an APTR record. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true that the, the message size increases. You, if, if it starts becoming a problem, you can mitigate that using uh, one of the new OpenSIP 2.1 uh, SIP compression methods or topology hiding if you're using an older OpenSIP. Um, Giving each NAPTR record a very clear name, um, you can just use it to. Uh, usually, you, you can make it. For example, you can uh, use the name of the machine that of the, the instance uh, that's that you're currently on, and then just add dash next as a host name. So uh, the NAPTR record for that instance dash next. Uh, will point so to the next step, step in the chain, and then you can just add more and more and more steps. And I, can add, I can add one more thing, which is that we don't care so much about the MQU size internally, because our network internally we find that we just want to make sure they don't be outside or coming yes. towards inside the yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Are you using UDP internal? Yeah, we use uh, UDP internal. Any other questions? Thank you.